there's a bit of a drizzle outside. Come on, sit down. There's some information I have to discuss with you. My name is Edward. I'm a detective of the traffic department. The agency tasked me to further investigate the disappearance of Packard. He was an up-and-coming rich boy in the first half of the century, but after the war, he just wasn't the same. And it went all downhill from there. Mistakes upon mistakes upon mistakes were made. And in the later 50s, he vanished. Welcome everyone to a jazzy noir 16th episode of the Automotive History series where we're going to further investigate what led to the eventual downfall, demise, and disappearance of Packard. I really don't want to go all too deep into the details, but this is a description of the victim. His full name is Packard Motor Car Company, but nicknamed Packard. He's born in 1899, and by the Roaring Twenties, he already made a name for himself as a successful rich kid with friends in high places. I'm talking about the rich and famous here in the USA and royal families across the pond. The victim made and saved up such huge amounts of money during the 1920s that he easily survived the crash of 29 and the depression years that followed. By 1942, he was drafted for the war he once again made huge amounts of money with war contracts, providing water and aircraft engines to the army. Now, other descriptions I have that characterizes the victim are a rich personality and even richer appearance, he always wore a graceful hood ornament, a styling trademark is his mirrored harp-like grill, and his life motto is Ask the man who owns one. Uh, Referring to his products, he never advertised his products himself. Instead, he let the content owners of his products do the advertising for him. I, I believe the idea was that his products were so good that customers would naturally talk about them and spread the word. Before and after the war, a couple times a week, in the evening, the victim would visit a local bar named The American. In there, he always played card games with three other men. These were Chrysler, Lincoln and Cadillac. Each of these men were also in the business of selling luxury products, just like Packard. Now, from what I understand, these weren't his friends, but more so his competitors, inside and outside of the card game. Before the war, the victim would own the table and always win, but after the war, the deck was reshuffled and the cards were dealt again. Cadillac laid a full house down on the table, three aces. These were a brand new V8 engine, four-speed automatic transmission and sleek looking car bodies. Now it was Packard's turn. Packard laid down only one good card, a new two-speed automatic transmission. But his other cards were rubbish. The straight 8 engine was renowned for its butter-like smoothness, but it was considered ancient compared to Cadillac's new V8. And then there were the new car body designs. Packard looked great right after the war. He was a perfect blend between modern day styling and classical touches like the harp-shaped grill. But as the years wore on, Packard gained an extra few pounds. Packard looked fat compared to Cadillac, who hit the gym two times a week. People in the bar noticed and called him a pregnant elephant. Ouch. Physically, Packard wasn't so fit anymore as he used to be. But his mind was also somewhere else. As a seller of luxury products, he had a hard time competing against his card playing colleagues. He had an idea. He read in the newspaper that the middle class market was moving upwards. What if he sold products at a lower price and level quality? It is a risk reward type of move. Packard could potentially sell a lot more products if they had middle class prices and quality but wouldn't it damage his name and reputation among his affluent clientele? Packard did the move and it turned out to be a full risk and no reward move. With the introduction of the Packard 200, an upper middle class car but not quite luxurious as Packard standard models, original Packard buyers started to get confused. 
Packard was the luxury rich boy, right? What is he trying to do? He deluded himself and his brand. You know when the rest of the competition is moving upwards and you start to look like second rate? Well, there was no need for the competition to move up market because Packard was already moving himself single-handedly down market. To add insult to injury, the Cadillac, Lincoln and Chrysler guys noticed Packard was losing control over himself and he became an easy target. They wanted to get rid of him. They started a vicious price war, lowering the prices for their products while the quality stayed the same. Packard still gained some money from the Korean War contracts, but since the war stopped, the much needed cash was gone and in no way was Packard prepared to battle a different kind of war, the price war. On top of that, Packard always outsourced some components of his products. Packard worked closely with a company called Briggs, who provided car bodies. In 1952, the owner of the company died and the company was going to be sold. Packard was unaware of this, but Chrysler stepped up and bought the company. As soon as Packard knocked on the door for a new load of car bodies, it was Chrysler that opened the door and said, Hey, tough luck there, buddy. This company is mine now and no way Jose that I'm ever going to sell any more car bodies to you. Packard went back to his own factory, hastily started up a new production line for car bodies, but he lacked the know-how of making quality car bodies. Packard, known for top-level build quality, became notorious for making cars that leaked, rattled and creaked. It was another night of losing card game after card game. Packard now was almost gone through all of its fortune. He was tired, out of shape, drunk. See, Packard was a lone wolf. The guys he played against, Lincoln, Cadillac and Chrysler, all worked for an even larger company. If these guys had a bad year, then it was the parent company who could make up for it. If Packard had a bad year, well, tough luck. There was no one to save him. He decided he had enough stood up and walked away from the table. On his way out to the door, some guys from the table next to him started to whisper at him. Psst, come over here, we want to discuss something with you. It was a table with three men, named Studebaker, Nash and Hudson. These men were called the Independents and were dealing with the exact same problems that Packard had. As a standalone man, they just couldn't compete with the big boys. Packard sat down at the table. Nash had a plan. What if these men would work together and unite? A strong business could be formed catering to all price levels. They'd become the new big boy. Nash and Hudson already formed an alliance and wanted to get Stu the Baker and Packard on board. But the more they discussed the plans that evening, the more Packard realized that the focus was on economy and not luxury. He remembered the whole Packard 200 fiasco and couldn't agree on the proposal and left the table. Packard walked out of the bar into an alleyway but was suddenly approached by Studebaker who was waiting there for him. Studebaker had an idea. What if Packard bought Studebaker's company and they'd work together? Packard thought for a moment and realized that Studebaker was somewhat of a big player. Maybe this was the way to get out of this financial hellhole. Packard thought that Studebaker could financially save him, that if he had a bad year, Studebaker could make up for it. What Packard didn't know was that Studebaker wasn't financially far off from Packard and in an equally bad position. Studebaker also thought that if he had a bad year, Packard was there for him to make up for it. Not knowing each other's secrets, they agreed to form an alliance. Now, you know the deal with negative times negative equals positive, right? Well, in this case, it was negative times negative equals double negative. In the coming years, Packard was getting bossed around by Studebaker. With the new alliance, Packard no longer had the freedom to design his own products. 
they always had to be based on Studebaker architecture. What followed were the so-called Packard Bakers. Packard once legendary and high quality products were now mediocre, spruced up and rebatched Studebaker products. Packard was no longer the good looking and well groomed gentleman. He became an alcoholic, looking like a cave dweller, with a facelifted face and a half assed ass job. The USA experienced an economic recession in 1958, and it really was the death knell for Packard. Years of bad mistakes led to a disgraceful body image and a non-existent fortune. Packard was sad, drunk, fat, ugly, and above all, broke. Guess what an economic crisis would do to someone like him? Yes, exactly. By 1959, he disappeared. Alright, so far I found six examples that led to the downfall of Packard. Most mistakes were made by himself, but not everything was in his own reach. Packard tried to do too much, to please too many different crowds and therefore betrayed himself. What is left is a man who didn't even recognize himself anymore. And the others left. Case closed. Hmm. Packard disappeared, but it is not known whether he is dead or alive. For over 40 years, all was quiet, until the late 1990s. In 1999, someone or something was spotted that looked like Packard. He was once again wearing a nice suit, but it was only a one-time encounter, and he disappeared again. The last known supposed sighting of Packard was in 2019. He was seen standing on the Packard Bridge, a sky bridge that connects two of his very own factory buildings over a stretch of road in Detroit. He was supposed to commit suicide, but just as he wanted to make the jump, the bridge collapsed. 